did you know? Instead of badges, Pokemon trainers almost traveled around collecting belts. Drawing inspiration from East Asian martial arts, the first gym leader would have given you a white belt and the last gym leader a black belt. Game Freak even considered letting you whip your Pokemon with them, like some sort of lion tamer. In our hunt for Pokemon secrets for this video, we went to great lengths to ensure that these facts would actually be something that, you know, roughly 99% of you had never heard of. And one thing we did was have 100 pages of a Japan-only book translated, which was written by Game Freak developer Akihito Tomisawa, and it's where this first fact comes from. In the book, Tomisawa writes, The development staff decided humans should have ranks as monster trainers. The initial idea was that, as the player's Pokémon reached a certain level of strength, they would earn belts like a martial artist. Recreating their conversation, he recalls them saying, Not just white belts and black belts like in Judo, there should be more colors. Well, if you could receive a belt, what if you could use it as a training whip, like a red whip or a black whip or a yellow whip? Tommy Sauer goes on to say that, ultimately, it was too cruel to make the player whip their Pokémon, so the idea got scrapped. Their relationship with the player should be friendlier, like a pet owner, so eventually it was decided you'd earn badges instead. But even though the belt idea got thrown out, actual whips were still very much on the menu. As we've mentioned in the past, this beta sprite shows Trainer Red carried a whip at some point in Red and Green's development. And even though Red's eventually got taken away, lots of other trainer's whips still made it into Generation 1's final build. Another interesting story we found in our translations was the time Pokémon's creator, Satoshi Tajiri, gave away a copy of Pokémon Red where the player was named Dumbass. In a 1997 issue of Japanese magazine Famimaga 64, he tells the interviewer Yuki, Recently I've been buying used copies of Pokémon at second-hand stores. It's interesting to see the nicknames people give their Pokémon. The player's name on this red one is a real gem. He named himself Dumbass. Maybe so the game will say, Player is a Dumbass, in the menu. Then, Tajiri whips out copies of red and blue that he pasted homemade stickers onto, which, if they still exist, are probably worth a fortune nowadays. After joking around with Yuki for a while, he gives her the custom red cartridge as a gift, then says he'll give away the custom blue cart and five of his autographs in a contest for the magazine's readers. Yuki wants to keep them all to herself, but eventually they agree Tajiri will also give away his copy of Red, where the player is named Dumbass. Whoever the lucky kid was who won the contest, hopefully never overwrote that save file. Before we get to more Pokemon facts, a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Manscaped.com. Christmas came early for DYKG as we've got the new performance package by Manscaped, the world's first men's all-in-one head-to-toe grooming kit. This includes the Lawn Mower 4.0 waterproof cordless trimmer. With an LED light and advanced skin-safe tech, it'll never snag your jingle bells. It also features the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray, and the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer, which has 360 rotatory blades and also has skin-safe safe tech so your ears and nose are just as safe as your down belows. But Manscaped now has every appendage covered with the new and improved Shears 2.0 Luxury 6-Piece Stainless Steel Nail Kit to keep your fingers just as trim as your big gym. And for a limited time, orders come with two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. This set is a great gift for a brother or dad, or you could treat yourself and join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped to give them the right tools for their family jewels. And get 20% off your Manscaped order plus two free gifts and free international shipping when you use promo code DYKG at manscaped.com. And now, back to Pokemon. Our next fact is about where the idea for fossil Pokémon came from. The answer can be found in a 34-page interview Tajiri did in the Japanese book Pokémon Story, published in the year 2000. It's pretty well known that Tajiri caught bugs as a kid in the mountains and forests near his home in rural Japan. His town modernized rapidly as he grew older, and the nature he'd catch bugs in got paved over and turned into a city, complete with an arcade where he'd often skip school to go play video games. As an adult, he combined those two ideas catching bugs and video games in order to make Pokemon. But what you probably haven't heard is the longer version of the story he tells in this book, where he says the construction workers discovered tons of fossils as they were paving over his childhood. Construction came to a total standstill until the fossil situation could be sorted out, and during that time, Tajiri and his friends made a habit of going to the site to dig up fossils of their own. He goes on to say that he later took a school trip to the Izu Islands south of Tokyo, and that's how he came up with Cinnabon. 
Far Island. In fact, the entirety of Kanto was based on his own childhood. Even Kanto's size was based on how far he could ride his bike as a kid. He says, I was able to ride my bike about 10 kilometers from home. The way riding my bike expanded the world around me was part of my inspiration for Pokemon. When you use a train, you feel like you're taking a trip. So for Pokemon, I wanted to keep things more grounded, like how my friends and I would see how far we could ride from home, to create a world that felt real. A little later in the interview, Tajiri says Generation 2's game world was based on how far he could take a train, which is why the region was originally modeled after the whole of Japan. 18 years after this interview, an early build of gold and silver leaked online, finally giving fans a chance to see the region Tajiri was talking about, which ultimately got scrapped and replaced with Johto. And check it out, it's Japan turned on its side. And now for more of a light-hearted tidbit, have you ever noticed Unova champion Alder breaks the rules of the Pokemon world by carrying more than six Pokeballs? We found an explanation in a 2010 issue of Japanese magazine Nintendo Dream, where Alder's creator, Yusuke Omura, says it's because he never learned how to use a computer. And also, weirdly, Omura had trouble making Alder not look like Jesus. <laughs> he says, As I drew Alder, I thought of him as a charming person, but my initial design was far too evangelist-like. He looked like Christ or something. But I couldn't get that image out of my head, so I consulted with Sugimori, who told me to dial back the evangelist shtick so he'd look like some kind of wanderer. Also, Alder has Pokeballs hanging not only around his neck, but under his cloak as well. That's because he doesn't know how to use a PC, so he's unable to store his Pokemon. Generation 5's art director, Ken Sugimori, was in that interview as well, and added, You're only supposed to be able to carry six at a time, so having seven or more Pokeballs is weird. But he can't use a PC, so he carries them all with him, not just his main team. All his balls are just jangling around. Ooh la la. Our next fact actually comes from that 1997 Famimaga 64 interview we mentioned earlier. One question Yuki asked Tajiri was why Porygon exists. Simply put, Porygon was created to be ironic as a response to all the people who told him 1996 was too late to make a Game Boy game. Here's how Tajiri explains it. At the time, I didn't see anyone playing Game Boy anymore and it had lost a lot of its popularity. I was at the barber shop once and someone asked, so you're making a game? What kind of game? When I told them, it's for the Game Boy, this guy I didn't even know said, the Game Boy? You're a bit late on that one. Everyone kept telling me, Tajiri, you need to start making Polygon games for next generation consoles. But I was designing Pokemon for Game Boy where it's impossible to use polyagonal 3D graphics. But people kept hounding me about it, so I thought it would be ironic to include a Pokemon called Porygon. Adults notice the irony, but kids don't get it. They just think, what a cute Pokemon, and play with it. Once they become a little more familiar with computers, they'll realize, oh, that was supposed to be irony. Pokemon has tons of words that kids won't understand the meaning of until 10 or 20 years later. If you're one of the fans who's realizing right now that Porygon was meant to be ironic, let us know in the comments. If you didn't realize before this video, that means that Tajiri's 1997 prediction actually came true. And our next piece is about how Pokemon was originally planned as a much smaller game, and Pokemon's producer Shigeru Miyamoto didn't even want it to be an RPG. Red and Green launched in 1996, but Tajiri pitched it to Nintendo subsidiary Creatures Inc. back in early 1990, with a contract to finish it in October the same year. In fact, Creatures thought it was going to be so similar to another creature collecting game they were going to make that they cancelled it out of respect for Tajiri. In that Tomisawa book we translated, Creatures chairman Tsunakazu Ishihara says, To tell you the truth, Creatures already had its own idea for a game like Pokemon, something incredibly similar. The game was called Toto, and it used the Game Boy like an insect cage to be filled with creatures you owned. At the same time we were talking about it, Tajiri brought us his idea for Pokemon, where youths catch monsters and trade them with a link cable. It wasn't a question of which idea came first, but we did think Tajiri would wonder, how could they do this to me when it was my idea? Ishihara goes on to say creatures thought the main difference between Toto and Pokemon was going to be the link cable trade trading, so they ultimately decided not to make Toto, but Tajiri's small idea eventually got a lot bigger, as he explained in another Japanese publication, saying, We figured we could probably make a Game Boy game in about six months, but our goals for Pokemon just grew and grew, so we eventually realized it would be difficult to develop that quickly. Of course, ultimately, our six-month plan didn't work out. 
Shigeru Miyamoto liked the idea of collecting and trading monsters because it was an idea that would only work on Game Boy, and he's always loved games that are only possible on the system they're played on. But even though he liked the concept, he didn't think Pokemon should be an RPG. Here's what he said in that Thomas Hour book. At the stage where we just had the basic idea for Pokemon, I didn't care what genre it would be. It was Tajiri who thought it wouldn't be complete if it wasn't an RPG. I was concerned that if we made an RPG, we wouldn't know when we'd finish, and I thought we should just focus more on the essence of the game. But as the producer, it wasn't my call, so Pokemon ended up in the form it is now, and I'm honestly not sure if that was the right decision. Now, more than 20 years later, I guess fans have to ask themselves, would Pokemon be a a better series if it wasn't an RPG? What if it was still about collecting and trading Pokemon, but the gameplay was an entirely different genre? Let us know in the comments if you think Tajiri was right to hold his ground, or if he should have listened to his idol, Shigeru Miyamoto. And now we're going to jump back into cut content from Generation 2, so let's talk about one of Johto's lesser-known scrapped areas, the Lost Suicide Forest. That entire Japan-based region was scrapped, but later in development there were also parts of Johto that got cut, but can still be found in the game's internal data. Most of them are just early designs for Johto's cities. Possibly the most interesting is the Lake of Rage, which originally had an entire town built around it. There's also a tiny safari zone, once meant for Fuchsia City. But the map we really want to highlight is this forest, which the data refers to as Fuji. This Fuji forest was originally located at the foot of Mount Silver, which is based on the real-life Mount Fuji in Japan. In fact, in early builds of Gold and Silver, Mount Silver was literally called Mount Fuji. In the real world, there's a forest at the foot of Mount Fuji called the Sea of Trees, also known as the Suicide Forest. It's got a historical reputation as a home to ghosts, and it's one of the most used suicide sites globally at over 100 deaths per year. The government even puts up signs in the forest that encourage suicidal visitors to think of their families and reach out to a suicide prevention association. By the way, all this information was sent to us by Pia Carrot, a Generation 2 disassembler and one of the members of Team Space World, so full credit goes to him. In Generation 2's final build, there's only one new ghost type, Mistrevus, who can only be found at Mount Silver. It's likely the forest was planned as a home not just for Mistrevus, but other ghost Pokemon as well, like these two that got cut during development. But in an effort to avoid the risk of controversy, Game Freak ended up cutting the location and replacing it with this map, which bears no resemblance to the Suicide Forest. Despite its removal though, the forest can still be found hidden in the game's internal data. Did you also know that Mew only exists because of a secret that was rumoured to be in an old arcade game? Click the video on screen if you want to hear the full story. Or if you want to learn more about Satoshi Tajiri, check out this mini-biography we made about his life story. Click the like button if you want us to keep translating more Pokemon books, and make sure to subscribe to stay in the loop. Thanks for watching. I didn't know most of this. Was there anything that shocked you? I think most of it shocked me.